research um, kind of un uncovered that I think the median income, household income of Queen's Commerce students is like 250k. <laughs> next episode of Friday with Friends. Today I'm here with Johnny and Johnny's a new friend although I feel like we probably should have met before like I, this is as Johnny said this doesn't seem like our first time meeting for some reason it, it's like we've known him for a long time uh, but yeah today I'm excited to dive into his story at Queen's Commerce a few of his internships. A notable one is that last summer he worked within Aritzia's internal consulting team. I'm a Aritzia girly, so I want to hear more about that. Uh, Johnny, let's start with the first question I ask everybody. Can you first share about your upbringing, high school experience, and career interests at the time? Yeah, um, so thank you so much for having me on the podcast. My name is Johnny. It's nice to meet all of you that are tuning in. But um, regarding my upbringing, um, I'm, I'm born and raised in in Markham. I say Toronto, but yeah, it's really Markham. And um, I guess my upbringing, I'm, I'm an only child. And so I think that has had a lot of effect on me. Um, I also grew up in um, a lower income bracket. And so that kind of, I think, developed into um, who, who I was as a person today. I'm really always looking for opportunities to help out the marginalized communities because I think um, I've had a lot of support to be able to be in the place I am today as well. Um, and I'm also Christian, and so um, a lot of those religious values have had um, I, somewhat of an effect on me as well, to an extent. Um, but with that being said, um, yeah, high school, I think, was pr pretty much like Winnet's, except for, um, you know, COVID at the end of the year, um, which is, I think, a lot of pretty common with a lot of the other people who have been on the podcast. Um, COVID has been um, something that really shaped up our, our my final year in, in particular. And um, yeah, at the time, I guess my what I was looking to do, I, I had no idea. I tried out the sciences, I tried out chemistry and physics, and I didn't really do very, very well in them. And so I was kind of just left with business. I wanted to pursue the arts, but because I have Asian parents, I can't pursue the arts. And so um, I went with business. And I, at the time, I also had a photography business. And so I was like, great, I can find a way, I can, I can kind of learn skills that I could then apply back to my photography business. And then, um, here we are now in, in business school at Queens, but would, would be happy to dive more into any of those areas. Yeah, that's so funny. I also wasn't very good at science, but I think like media and entertainment is where my heart lies. But then yeah. you are Asian, we're Asian, and then you go to business, which is like, hmm, maybe I can still do some media entertainment, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah exactly. Was Queens Commerce your dream school? Where else did you apply? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and and on the note of like the creativity and that kind of thing, I think that's why um, I wanted to work at Aritzia um, in, in the first place. And, and we'll be happy to touch on that later on. But um, regarding Queen's Commerce, no, it was actually not my first choice. Um, or yeah, I, I actually didn't think I was going to get in. So um, in, in high school, I didn't I didn't touch upon, upon this, but um, I Put a lot of pressure on myself like I was always like kind of like stressed and anxious about everything and so a part of that was I really didn't think that I was kind of like worthy enough to get into um, any of the top business programs in Canada and so um, I had my eyes set on Laurier and not to say that Laurier is a bad program I, th I still think it's a great program um, but with that being said I thought it was more attainable at the time and I really appreciated that they were um, that they offered a co-op program which was quite rare when it came to business schools and so I went to the info session, I did all my research, I talked to everyone there, and yeah, I, I applied. And then part of like my OU application, I literally just put Queen's Commerce like for fun. I was like, why not? I'm already applying. I didn't even apply to Ivy. And I think that shows like how I wasn't actually even like gearing for these business schools to begin with. But um, I just applied to Queen's Commerce on the whim. Um, remember doing the application on the last day and then got in. So no, to, 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 to let you know, no, it was not my... Um, my top school. And um, I think that, yeah, all the other like business schools, like the content wise is, is the same across the board. It really comes down um, to, I guess, the network. But at the same time, even if you don't go to like um, the quote unquote top universe, like business programs in Canada, there's a really like 
LinkedIn is a great resource. There's lots of opportunities outside of just the school network for you to really tap into. Um, and like Wynette, right? I, I think like especially how she didn't go to a target school, but yet she's still landing all these awesome internships, I think is a really great testament to how um, you're able to build that network on your own. So props to her. But yeah, that's a little bit about um, when I was applying. I do want to ask this question. What's diversity like at Queen's Commerce? Because when I was in grade 12, I really wanted to get in, but at the back of my mind, I just thought, well, I feel isolated coming from, you know, my more like middle, middle income background. Yeah, I think there was a report that came out. So, so yeah, um, as some of you may know, Stolen by Smith came out um, in 2020 during the pandemic. And I think a part of that um, kind of research um, kind of un uncovered that I think the median income household income of Queen's Commerce students is like 250k something like that um, but it's, it's a very high number and um, to be honest with you like I like my family is nowhere near that and so um, it's definitely a privilege that I'm able to be here uh, their financial resources are, are great like um, the amount of bursaries and scholarships and awards that I've been able to um, receive year after year has really enabled me to attend this program so I think they do a really good job on that front but um, regarding diversity and inclusion um, yes those experiences those lived experiences by many um, minority groups marginalized communities um, who happen to attend Queens those were all like real and valid those did happen and they still do continue to happen but with that being said um, I genuinely believe that it's becoming um, better in the sense that there are um, more, there's more diverse representation that we're seeing day to day. Um, professors and students are taking the time to educate themselves and, and learn on their own about um, how to be supportive of these um, kind of um, different communities, these, um, individuals from different backgrounds. And on top of that, the school has also implemented a lot more um, initiatives to kind of um, improve their DEI efforts, one of which um, is their EDI3 program that Queen's Commerce runs. Um, this is something that they introduced um, a couple years ago, two, two years ago, and it's just for um, first, second, and third year students. Um, and, and this is a program that um, is just for equity deserving students. Um, it's a tailored job board for them to find opportunities, internship opportunities, just for um, equity deserving groups. And that's where I, I found one of my internships um, when I was in second year. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of stuff that's being done in, in that regard to kind of equalize the playing field in that sense. And so it's not necessarily just, um, you know, who you know or what your family background is. About, is. I think um, in that sense, it, it can provide some sort of comfort to a lot of um, high schoolers who, who might be on the fence of whether or not um, they want to come to Queen's Commerce, as I know that... Um, yeah, diversity and inclusion is, is such an important topic that um, more and more people are kind of seeing the importance of, which is important, which is valuable. It really does sound like Queen's Commerce has been putting in strides to ensure that, or like to try and level the playing field, like that mm -hmm. program for equity deserving students to get internships, like that's something they don't have to do. Whereas, you know, the students that do come from, let's say like the top brackets, like they have connections already in place. So it seems like Queen's yeah. Commerce is really trying to bridge that gap. And that's rare. Like I'm I'm very surprised that they've walked the walk on that front. Yeah. And we also have a lot of um different clubs um supporting um other equity deserving groups such as women. Um there's like the Queen's Women in Leadership. Um and there's a lot of um there's um, like Women in Finance Club and uh, all these different clubs that are just for different um, equity deserving groups, which I think is also really cool. And mm -hmm. the new dean has been putting in a lot of work um, to ensure that um, there's a platform for people to, you know, speak up if there's anything where they, they feel like they're they're missing out on opportunities. And, and she's been really, she's been like taking a very proactive approach to make sure that um, just the students feel welcome and comfortable being in, in the space. How is the adjustment from high school into university and especially into such a competitive program like Queen's Commerce? I think in first year it was the most challenging because it was the first year of university. I was um, navigating, you know, university courses and, and schedules for the first time. But on top of that, it was also online. And in high school, I was very like academics focused I, I still am but not to that extent and what that meant was I tried to do like everything to like 110 percent um that's not well it is possible but it's not encouraged in university in the sense where um in first year 
I recall literally spending like entire days working on um, not even my own work, like my group mates work, because we would have so many group assignments in, in commerce because they really value that team building and yeah, collaboration kind of thing. But yeah, I, I took it upon myself to do other people's work because um, I felt like it wasn't to the quality that I wanted it to be. And that caused a lot of unnecessary stress, a lot of more unnecessary hours put in. Um, and that was the first time that I learned to kind of take a step back and really um, not try to control everything. There's a lot of things in life that, that we can't control. And so we need to learn to let go at times. Um, but it was also the first time I was introduced to the concepts of um, the 80-20 rule, a previous principle, um, where 20% of our inputs lead to 80% of our results. And um, nowadays, I'm really looking for those 20% um, highest impact activities to focus my time on because those lead to the greatest results and, and doing other people's work is, is not doing anyone good, not even to yourself and not to the other people. So that's I, I, that was my first year experience. And that was the lesson I took away from it. 80-20, I've heard so much about that. Yeah. And I think there's a common theme when I have these podcasts, people talk about highest ROI activities, like what you have, you know, and not to be all finance, bro, but like, w will studying like an extra one hour for your exam do you better than having a coffee chat with like a hiring manager for one hour? And it's kind of like, totally. I mean, the coffee chat's going to make you go further. So I'm curious, like so far, what do you think your 20 is? What works for you in, in getting those results? Yeah, for 20%, I, I would say it, it's, it's like go back to your psychology class, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you need to focus on yourself first before you can pour it out to other people. Um, it's all about filling your cup so you can pour it out. And so to fill my own cup, I, I need eight to nine hours of sleep. I know it's absurd. Um, I go to bed like latest 11 p.m. typically on, on most nights. Um, and so that's the, that's part of the 20 percent that I've identified because I cannot function well um, if I don't have sleep. Second thing is like eating a balanced diet, you know, get your veggies in, your whole grains, your your proteins, that kind of thing. And then um, also exercise. Exercise is really important. I think government in Canada recommends 120 minutes. Don't quote me on that. It's something like that. But um, yeah, it's not hard to do like, you know, five minutes of quick micro workouts in between your study sessions. Like it doesn't need to be um, a crazy, you know, full blown one hour full body workout if you don't have the time for it. And but everyone has time for like a five minute workout or even a 10 minute workout. Right. And so there really is no excuse there. And so I think those are like the three like health pillars on top of that. I would say like relationships. It's really important. Um I think a lot of people say this, and, and I'm a firm believer of it as well, but you're the average of um, the five people around you. And so really being intentional about the people that you want to surround yourself with and making um, meaningful time to, to spend with them. And um, yeah, in, in whatever way that that mean is, is to you. And then um, I guess like my, my religion and my spirituality is also really important to me. And so that's like the fifth thing. Um, but I think spirituality doesn't have to be religion it's it's kind of just like a deeper why as to like why we're here on this earth like like what are we doing like what are we working towards it doesn't need to be a religion but for me it is but um, it could be different things for different people so yeah that, that's the 20 percent for me and notice how none of those were like even you know academics or um professional career life yeah no i i love that because like you in first year i thought like I, I thought to get results, like I had to be doing other people's work. I had to be studying like 10 hours a day and I didn't have time to exercise. Like I didn't have time to think about my meals ahead of time. Like I didn't have time to, to plan. Like I might skip meals because I was studying. And, and the truth is that is so like backwards. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy you brought up exercise because as a fitness instructor during yeah. exam season, everyone like didn't come to class like the classes were empty but then the incremental value that you get from attending a fitness class for one hour is so much higher than you would yeah. putting an extra an hour to like study you know like think about those 20 percent that 20%, you get yeah. Off. yeah and there's so many studies that show that um people who um exercise actually get higher gpas to begin with and so um, it's it's important to think like not that these other activities are taking away from your primary goal like your primary goal can be academics but rather um, all these other things are actually contributing to that primary goal um, and it's it, that reframing in your mind is really powerful um, therapy helped a lot 
for me to, to reframe it. Cause, cause yeah, I was totally that student who um, felt like all those other activities didn't actually contribute to my academics, didn't contribute to my career or whatever. But um, in the end, it turns out that they actually do. Seeing your friends on a random Wednesday night, that can also contribute to your academics. Totally. You know, it gives you life, it gives you energy. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's something to kind of push you forward, motivate you, something to look forward to, I think is really important when we're stuck in the mundane of studying and recruiting and whatnot. Um, it's really nice to kind of, yeah, get together on a weekday and something to look forward to, something that makes me work a little bit faster so that I can kind of get to the good part later. But yeah, not not that like studying isn't enjoyable. I think for some people it can be, but for me, it, it depends on the course, honestly. Did yeah. you speak your entire internship journey so far? I think um, my entire internship journey has been very rough, if I'm being honest. It's um, definitely has not been the most glamorous kind of route. Um, so in first year, I had no idea what was going on. Like I had no idea what, fi what finance is. I had no idea what consulting is. Um, no idea. Like, yeah, just like because I didn't necessarily have any any family, any, any family friends who were working in those industries. And so um, and I wasn't also wasn't on campus. It was online. And so I kind of had to figure it out on myself and it, it didn't go so well. I didn't figure it out. And I ended up not having an internship in, in first year, which is not not a big deal, by the way. Um, and so I decided to kind of keep working on my business at that time, um, kind of doing more photo shoots and, and growing my client base and also doing some volunteer work at the end, just on the side, just to kind of um, make use of my time. So that was my first year. And then second year um, was when I leveraged that um, equity deserving EDI3 program at, at Queens that I mentioned earlier. Um, this was the first year that it was being um, released and I was part of that pilot, pilot cohort group. And so they didn't reach out to us until April. So it was like April, April, end of April, you know, everyone around me already had internships. I didn't. Um, I was applying to, throughout the year, I applied to so many different companies. Um, I had no idea what I was doing wrong. Um, I, 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 don't, I still don't really know what I was doing wrong. Like I was doing everything that the career coaches were telling me to do. I refined my resume. I reached out to people, um, didn't, didn't land a single interview in second year. Um, but luckily enough, um, through that um, EDI3 program, I was actually able to land an internship at a mental health company. And so this wasn't like your typical kind of business, you know, what, what, people typically in business would go for it. But um, at the time, and, and I still am, I'm, I'm really kind of um, passionate about just like holistic health and like living um, a healthy and balanced lifestyle and that kind of thing. And so um, that really, there was definitely alignment there. Um, and I was doing um, marketing for them. And so they didn't have a marketing department, but they were tasked from the government of Ontario, Health Canada, uh, or sorry, not the, not the government of Ontario, the government of Canada, Health Canada, um, they were tasked to kind of um, send out this mental health program for frontline workers. And they had this 8 million budget to do to, to do it. Absolutely huge, because at the time, um, there wasn't really anything on the market for it. Um, it was a really unique product. It was um, evidence. It was the first um, program, like mental health program for frontline workers that was like evidence based. They, they designed it in collaboration with um, University of Saskatchewan, I believe, or Regina, I think it's Regina. Um, and then um, they needed to kind of send this out and get the word out. And so I was brought in um, to kind of run their marketing efforts. So I had this whole budget to use. I had sort of an idea of what I was doing, but um, yeah, definitely lots of learning came out of that. Um, lots of autonomy, which I really enjoyed. And so that was my second year experience. And then third year um, was just this past summer and I was at Aritzia, um, part of their strategy and operations department. And there I was, um, I was working in their e-commerce department, trying to create um, a growth strategy for how they can um, kind of better bolster their e-commerce experience, especially for U.S. customers, um, because compared to competitors um, in the retail industry, they're significantly lagging behind. There's notably like no personalization, which is really, really important in today's um, kind of digital age. And so that was one of the aspects that I was doing research on, doing a lot of competitor research um, and then kind of devising this final recommendation for them. So that was what I was doing when I was at Aritzia. Could we get more detail into your internship at Aritzia in strategy and ops within their internal consulting team? Did you move to BC for that internship? What was the office like? And really, I'm just dying to know what what little details you can you can provide. I I will try to share as much as I can. Um, but 
we'll we'll start with kind of um what internal consulting is like and so um i haven't done external consulting before well, i kind of like through through school and that kind of thing but not necessarily at the big four um, or other consulting firms so i might not be the best to to compare but from what my friends have told me um ours are better they're definitely better at at Aritzia just because it's internal consulting because um deadlines are just inherently more flexible um the clients is Aritzia themselves and they're, they're a lot more understanding. Um, you also see a project from beginning to end. And so for that e-commerce project that I was talking about previously, for example, um, like I did the whole, like basically the whole thing and I did from beginning to end and I didn't have to kind of hop off the project like, like midway. Um, so that was a really cool experience. Um, and I guess just like internal consulting, um, it's, it's fairly similar in the sense where you're, 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 our clients are the different departments of Aritzia. And so um, e-commerce was one of those departments that I was tasked on. Uh, but another ex example of a client could be like the marketing department or the um, retail department of the actually like retail store development side of things or, or the product department designing gar garments for, for the company. So um, it, it really um, is also broad in that sense, but, but highly specialized in the sense that um, it, it's all in the fashion kind of sector and all about retail. It was pretty cool, I think, um, working for a fashion company. Like, I remember um, they had this huge room in the main lobby where models would be coming in every day um, to do fittings and try-ons. There would be photo shoots going on, um, which of course, I had to um, learn all about. And it, it was really exciting because I'm interested in photography, but I also got to see um, their behind the scenes like editing process, how they kind of get every photo on their catalog um, on their website, aritzia.com. You see like every photo looks so consistent and lighting's all like consistent. And even though they shoot in different locations, like it's not just Vancouver, a lot of the models are from New York. And so they have a New York office as well. Like, how do you make sure all the photos look the same? So stuff like that, that I was really intrigued about. But outside of that, yeah, like um, they had floors of like clothing, just racks and racks of clothing. Um, like at the time, the super puff pants weren't weren't released. They're released now, but I thought they were really cool looking. Um, some people don't, but they're essentially like just, yeah, they're literally like puffy pants. Um, and, and they were on the rack when I was um, doing the internship and they weren't released. So you could see like everything was very confidential you could not take photos or anything so but um i thought it was really cool to see kind of the behind the scenes um how they kind of create the garments how they decide um you know how they like the colors they want to include what stores they want to send it to um et cetera, et cetera. um and then yes i did i did move to bc um and i lived in vancouver for three months they had to cut the internship short which sucked but um but that being said, they were still able to kind of um, embed all of the necessary um, experiences in, into that three month period. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love Vancouver, would definitely consider moving there. Um, the mountains are awesome. And I just felt really grounded when I was there. Were there other interns like working there? Yes, there were, um, I believe, like 25 interns in total. Um, which was actually smaller, a smaller cohort than, than the year before. The year before, I think, had anywhere from 40 to 50 interns. And um, it's not just the strategy and operations department. They also um, have interns for their products department, so, so merchandising. Um, and I also, I also believe they had an intern for, for the finance department, um, as well as marketing. But yeah, with that being said, um, there's a lot of different interest areas um, within Aritzia if you're interested in the company and um, their internships um, applications are currently open, I believe, and they close um, end of January. So if anyone is interested, you can also reach out to me. How does working for an internal consulting team differ from an external one, let's say MBB or Big Four? You mentioned timelines are a bit more understanding okay. on the internal end, but are there any other points you want to talk about? I guess there's also no travel, like they're huge on this. Um, I, I think they they really, um, they compare themselves to the big four, I think in, in terms of the the type of work that they do. Uh, but to that extent, there's there's no travel, which can be a pro, can be a con. Um, but it, for, for many of the individuals who work at Aritzia, part of their consulting group, um, they really value that aspect of no travel, how they can um, work. It, it's a hybrid model, so they can oftentimes work at home. Um, they can come into the office they, if they want, but also the client is, is on site at all times. And so that back and forth communication, and again, 
by client, I mean like the departments we're working with that we're collaborating with, they're all on site, all in the office. And so it's a lot easier if you if you need a document or if you want to um, ask someone to check over something really quickly, there's um, just a lot less back and forth and collaboration, I think, is, is a lot easier. Um, and then I forgot to mention this as well, but um, within the Aritzia um, office, there's this really cool um, kind of working collaboration space it's it's called the commissary it, it's not really meant for that it, it's really like their cafeteria but it, there's like an a-ok -okay cafe in there they have um I, I, like they have private chefs there there's free ice cream it's also a great place to collaborate with other people a lot of people um work in that space and so um just being able to you know have one area to gather and work um really speeds things up that i think um a lot of other consultants would envy i never thought of the bureaucracy of bureaucracy of being like a consultant like it de de depending on your client like how long yeah. those take. I think maybe that's why they have to work weekends they receive something late and then totally. they have to you know, go and like actually dig that up or prepare the deck so yeah that's yeah. a great point and it's it's I think it's another point of that is like everyone's aligned on the same kind of vision mm -hmm. and um, I think that helps a lot because you're working towards the same goal like you actually feel like you're a part of the team because sometimes when you're kind of called in as an external consultant um, it can there can be like that norming storming phase and that where you're trying to understand what the client really wants but um, they, they aren't really articulating it um, which, which can be a common challenge and so um, that was definitely not something that I experienced because everyone was very much aligned on what needed to get done because everyone's kind of strategic priorities were, were very much um, aligned across a couple of pillars. Can you speak about your extracurricular involvement in university? So I was lucky enough to be a part of um, a club all throughout my my four years of university. It's called the Intercollegiate Business Competition, um, which also happens to be um, Canada's oldest and largest business case competition. Now, I never thought I would be in any sort of club like this. I kind of just, um, in, in first year, I was kind of looking at the different clubs that I could join and ICBC, which is what, what its short form is, um, ICBC just happened to be one of the, the earlier postings. And so I applied, um, luckily got an interview and then luckily got past that round. And then I ended up being one of their first year representatives, which was really cool. And then um, I really loved the team dynamic. I loved the event planning aspect of it um, and, and, the, and the sheer scale of the events. Like it's a um, 500 stakeholders fly into Kingston and they participate in this case competition across three days. And um, just at the time, I didn't really experience anything like that. There wasn't, um, especially during the pandemic, I already wasn't seeing that many people. And so to see all these different people from all these different schools, from Asia, from Europe, from the States, all over Canada, um, that really resonated with me and, and has stuck with me ever since. And so that's why um, I've kind of stayed on that. And then I was co-chair last year. And then now I'm in a more kind of hands-off role, senior advisor. Shout out to the co-chairs because they're doing all the heavy lifting. But um, yeah, really excited for this upcoming event in, in January, which I'll be a part of. So that, that's the main extracurricular um, activity. And then I also do um, like I, I, I'm a teaching assistant on the side as well, if you if that is uh, an extracurricular, but um, yeah, happy to touch on that as well. That was one of my questions. You were a teaching assistant. You are teaching assistant over yeah. and over and over. You, you, you know, helped out in so many courses. Yeah. How do you become a TA? What are your roles and responsibilities? Do you recommend it as a part time job for students? TAing, I think, is it can be really fun, but it can also be really exhausting. And so I'll touch on both points. Um, but how I got into TAing, well, um, it pays pretty well. Like it's, it's, um, and it, I think it is, I think it looks pretty good, like in the sense that, um, you know, you've shown a certain level of expertise in, in, in a course's material beyond what's necessarily needed. And so that's always that, that kind of what drew me into the beginning. And so then I kind of just applied and, and reached out to professors that um, I think I really vibed with um, and who kind of had similar personalities, were receptive to kind of like, um, you know, conversations, whatnot, and then just asked if I could TA for them. And then um, luckily they said yes. And then it kind of just snowballed because once you TA with one professor, then um, like you already have experience, it's a lot easier to transfer it to another course. And um, you take so many different courses during um, a commerce degree. So there's there's so many to choose from. And so um, I just chose the ones that, um, yeah, that I, I really like the professors and I really like the course content. Um, 
but my my recommendation for for those of you who who would want to um ta is is choose courses that you would not mind learning more about because um just the level of understanding and depth you need to get to be a ta for for of course there's there's some like qualitative courses that, that um, are, are fine, but I think for the more quant heavy courses where you actually have to um, dive deeper into the understanding beyond just like memorizing formulas, uh, you actually have to be like interested in, in learning that material because you're, you're basically becoming like a subject matter expert. Um, and if you want to be a TA, I'd also recommend um, like running tutorials. I did that for the first time um, this past semester and it was a lot better than just being a TA behind the scenes, like marking papers, which I still have to do by the way. And, and that's, that's kind of like the daunting side of things that I I, I don't like um, and, and the really tiring aspect of TAing but the things I do like actually comes from the engagement with students the um, kind of trying to fill in their knowledge gaps and trying to kind of um, run tutorials in, in a engaging manner like those were the things that I really enjoyed about being a TA whereas marking is very mundane and I don't really like it so um, it's a mixed bag you're still gonna have to mark like regardless it's it's whether or not you can um, kind of cope and and manage with that con. I only TA'd for one course you've TA'd <laughs> for many but I think marking was always like the ooh, I would see it on my to-do list and it was like okay great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually still marking. I, I I still have a couple of final exams to go through. Um, yeah, it, it's really bad. It, it's it's like you're looking at the same question over and over again. Um, and to the point where you like have it memorized. And it's always easier for you to mark a, a right answer than a wrong answer. Because for a wrong answer, you always have to give feedback. And so, um, yeah, for that course, maybe I just didn't, I didn't run the tutorials as good as I could have, but um, there, there's a lot of feedback that I'm giving. Um, it, it is a difficult course. It's operations management for the record, but oh um, yeah, that yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty challenging course, but um, yeah, it, it, uh, as a result, it's taking a lot of time to actually provide that feedback and, and make meaningful comments, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, that, that makes so much sense. <laughs> right now for my TA, it's like every time I mess up a question, they write like yeah. this much of feedback, like yeah, and they're and like most a lot of these mandatory courses have like upwards of five hundred students, and so imagine doing that five hundred different times. Okay, maybe like a hundred of those students get it like perfectly correct, but there's still a good four hundred of those who need um, comments. And luckily, a lot of them make the same mistakes, but still, it's that fact of like you know copy and pasting, and then figuring out which comment to to give them, and then giving them a final grade, that kind of thing. But um, other than that, it's fine. Like I would do it. Um, the hours. Um, are quite flexible and they align with your kind of student schedule. Like usually the, the professors, when you're marking midterms, it's it's after it's when you're done midterms. So, so you finish your own midterms and then you mark the midterms. And then same for final exams. You finish your final exams and then you mark the final exam. So I think um, the flexibility of the role um, makes it a an ideal part-time job while you're in university if you're trying to make some money on the side. Pay is better yeah, than pay pretty good. Yeah. compensation for, for this like headache marking. And it, I think at, at the end, I'd much rather be a TA than like, I don't know, work work at a, like a retail store or something. Yeah. And and I've, I've kind of done both um, in the sense where I, I worked at Starbucks before. So um, I, I guess that's retail, but and, um, yeah, hundred percent agree with that. And the, the fact that you can just TA and, and mark in the comfort of your own home, I think is, is really valuable. Um, and it's also like, sometimes like we need to learn to be like, okay with doing hard things. Like there's some things in life where we just have to like put our head down and, and just do the work. And I don't know, I, I think it's a very like good practice of just like doing something difficult for me because I, I really don't like it. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's something a part of me that like, likes challenging myself to do hard things so I don't I don't hate it in that sense I where I heard this was it a tv show I think it was just like a comedy show something stupid but it was just like I can do hard things and that's yeah, just you can. thing. but like you can do hard things and it's okay to do hard things yeah there's this saying like where um the the magic you're looking for is in the work you're avoiding and I think that's it's a really good um kind of mentality to have where um a lot of the times we're just avoiding the things that um, will actually get us the farthest and so um, mm. it's really it's really it's a good reminder sometimes to really lean into that discomfort and um, when we do things that are uncomfortable uncomfortable to us like we grow exponentially like personally professionally whatever that is and so um, yeah always looking for things that are challenging um, and in this case it happens to be TA. I 
really want to hear more about your business, Johnny Wong Photography. Hi. I've seen a few of your pictures and it's very Aritzia coded. Like it seems very like Gen Z Instagram, but not like Instagram baddie, you know, like the yeah, yeah. like clean stuff. Thanks. Can you share about how you got into photography in the first place and when you decided to make it a business? So in recent years, it's honestly been a lot less of that, surprisingly. I think ever since I got into university, um, I've shifted to do a lot more kind of event photography, headshots, as it is in, in business. But um, it all started when I was in high school. And um, I remember every Friday, like we would, like me and my friends, we would just be like trying to find something to do. And so there was this one time where I brought my camera and I literally just asked if they wanted to take photos. And then we ended up going to these different locations. Like we would go to holiday markets and I'd bring my camera and then we'd do a photo shoot there. Um, we'd go to like the the greenhouse nearby, like to buy plants. And then I'd, and then I'd bring my camera there and then tell them to stand in front of the plants. We'd go downtown and then um, the same thing would happen. And through that, I was able to build a portfolio. And so the portfolio you actually see on my website right now is most like 80 percent 90 percent of them are my friends and so um they yeah so they're not actual models but um it's a testament to how like it, it's actually pretty easy to build up your own portfolio with the people you already know like you don't need like if you're interested in photography like you don't especially like portrait photography you don't necessarily need to hire models or do all that um initial legwork it's it's really just um kind of just go out and shoot and, and learn how to use a camera, learn how to um, frame things and learn how to edit and compose images and whatever. And so um, it, that process of really building my portfolio, I think that was just a very um, natural kind of path into just making money out of it. So people started posting on Instagram, um, people liked my photos and then asked if I would take their prom photos for high school. And so then those were my first clients, like um, students who who needed prom photos. And then it kind of um, became like people's parents who ran businesses on the side. I had a friend who's, whose mom um, had a concert and then I took photos at, at their concert. And then it was really just word of mouth, like very much organic. And then um, that's kind of how I get my gigs nowadays too. It's a lot of like events, a lot very business oriented just because of friends that I know who are like, oh, like I have a friend who who takes photos, like, would you be interested? And then, but but what I have in the portfolio right now is, is really, I think, what drew me in in the first place. Like, I really like capturing uh, people's best moments in that sense and, and making them um, look really, like, nice. I think my friends look really nice in those images, and um, I, I'd argue they'd agree too. And um, a lot of people don't see themselves in that light. And so um, for me to kind of give them a photo and be like, hey, like, this is what you look like. Like, this is how I see you in that sense. Um, I think that's a really memorable way to celebrate a person. So um, that's how I got into photography. To celebrate a person. That is such, like, that just makes me so happy to hear. And I thought your friends were models. Like, <laughs> thank you. I think so too. They should be. Um, yeah, I, I just am lucky enough to have um, some very good looking friends. But in that sense, I don't think, like, I think, like, you can take photos of, of anyone and make them look good at all. Like, it doesn't, yeah. I, I was so impressed. Like, I was like, oh, if I saw this one, yeah, I wouldn't have been bad an eye. Like, I would just, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got a lot of inspiration from just like looking at fashion magazines and and trying to understand the way that they pose their models and then um, kind of tell my friends to do a similar um, pose. Yeah, like my Pinterest is just so many different model yeah. poses and, and that kind of thing. So. During the pandemic, I saw that on your LinkedIn, you sold presets. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell me a bit about that? Because I know Bisco, like it's huge with presets. <laughs> What I sold was was very similar to that um, in the sense that they were um, Lightroom and Photoshop presets. And um, it's it's very similar to Visco where I, I, I'm not too familiar with Visco, so tell me if I'm wrong. But from what I understand it to be, it's like you're you're increasing like the the, the contrast and the exposure and whatnot and the hue. So, yeah, every like Lightroom Photoshop lets you do the same thing, but in a more kind of intricate level. And so I was basically just creating my own from photos that I, I took and then selling them to my existing clients because um, I started with existing clients because I felt like they resonated with my work already. They were already familiar with my brand. And um, just the feedback that I always got was like, oh, like I really liked the way you edited my photos. Um, mm. I remember how this color looks like 
how can I do this for myself? Like, how can I, how, how can I recreate this? And so um, I kind of met that need by creating and selling these presets to them. And yeah, I think it was a really cool experience because I was able to transition um, this inherently service-based company into a product-based company. And it goes to show how, I think how much, how like more scalable a, a product-based company can be. And so, um, yeah, really always thinking about ways I can kind of improve on my business. Um, and in all honesty, though, it's, it's, I think, um, I've been trying to kind of take a step back away from my photography as, as running it as a business, just because I've found that um, the more time I spend on building it, the less I'm enjoying the craft and the Yeah. art of creating. And so, um, yeah, I don't post as much anymore. Definitely would like to post more. Uh, but yeah, that's that's why I'm kind of like, I don't really market it anymore in that sense. Yeah, I feel the same. Like I started TikTok and it was just like there's there's like the art of creating and then sometimes it can feel like a chore and I think it takes Yeah. away from And and that's I think that's a really good cue. Like when it becomes a chore, then um it's it should be a signal for you to take a step back and reevaluate whether or not if this is becoming more of a, a chore than if it's actually like um kind of building on that passion in a sense. What would you like to do a year from now? You're graduating in April, which you're talking Yeah. so crazy. I'm sure it flew by super fast. And maybe 10 years from now. Okay, yeah. Um I think a year from now I would like to be in some type of role that I think allows me to be creative, um, leverages my creative skills, but also um, meshes kind of my business background. And I don't know what that kind of looks like at the moment. It could be consulting, it could be not, uh, but I'm still currently exploring, trying to figure out on my own. And so with that being said, that that 10 year timeline, I Honestly, I don't like to put that type of pressure on myself. Um, so what I like to say is like, um, I, I want to just become a better person so that I can better serve the people around me, if that makes sense. And so um, really looking to just find ways to to improve professionally, personally, um, in, in a diverse range of opportunities. I know that's really vague, but it, it's, yeah, it's also because like, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. And I think... If anything, these past few years has taught me is that like we we cannot predict the future um, and there's so many things that could change in a matter of moments. Like, for example, uh, my mom was diagnosed with with breast cancer last year. And so that has completely uprooted a lot of what I had initially planned, like last year, for example. And so um, I think th it's these moments like that that tells that just it's a good reminder to focus more. on the present and what we currently have and not be so focused on um, the future, what's coming next and chasing for that next big achievement or milestone. Not to say that those are important. I think goals are really, really important. But at the same time, so many of us are so focused on um, that final end goal as if there is any final end goal. But at the moment, it seems like a final end goal. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think right now I'm, I'm reminding myself to just um, be with my family, uh, be present, um, spend meaningful time with them, which is, I think, um, especially important during the holiday season. So that's what Yeah. I'm focusing on. Looking into the future, just what what type of hobbies like do you do Yeah. you maintain? Like do you are you really passionate about, I don't know, like are you into a certain workout or whatever? Yeah, Like yeah. I I I do enjoy exercising. Um I enjoy running marathons. That's um something that I enjoy doing. Um Wow. I haven't been doing anything recently, but um over the summer I was doing a lot of running. Um so when it's not like disgusting outside like this right now, I would be outside running. Um and then I also do swimming. I used to do competitive swimming. So that just kind of helps with the the cardio that is needed to run a marathon. Um and then just weightlifting. I, I don't really like weightlifting, but I think it's just a necessity um, so that I can be a better runner and be a better, like, I guess, overall just athlete, if that makes sense. Um, so that's like the physical kind of hobbies and then creative stuff. Um, photography is one of them. I also like to play the guitar. Um, I'm learning piano right now. I, I'm taking piano lessons um, in Kingston, actually. It was something I, I never had the opportunity to take piano lessons when I was growing up. I always wanted to. Um, but now that I have the means to, Um, I'm I'm kind of touching more with my childhood self and and taking piano lessons I think is really cool. Um, so yeah, and then um, and then I guess like intellectual hobbies. I kind of like to bucket my hobbies like that. I don't know. I just like adding frameworks to everything. Um, but with um, yeah, that that side of things, um, 
really enjoy reading. I like um, reading memoirs and nonfiction books. I think our, our time on earth is kind of so short and a great way to kind of extend that and live different lives is through other people's stories. And what better way to, you know, get someone's life for like $20. I think it's a steal. So I, I love reading books and also play chess. I've been playing that a little bit too much though recently. So we can accept that for that. And I'm not good. Like the bad thing is I'm not good. Like I just, I, I like playing it, but I suck. I'm just going to ask like what your ELO is. Oh my gosh. It's like 700. I think it, <laughs> it's from 500 to 700. But for the record, I played the five minute one, which I think the ELO ratings are a little bit lower than the 10 minute one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like, it's not hot. Like, I have a roommate who is, like, 1,200, like, 1,300. I, I haven't beat him once, and we play, like, every week. Like, <laughs> Wow. So do you, so you, when you say you play too much, do you, like, do you yeah. open the browser and just find yourself playing? Or do you knock on your roommate's door and be like, let's play, let's play, let's play? Yeah, I'm literally, like, like the latter. Like, let's play. Um, Like, so many evenings, um, I'm just asking him, hey, like, do you want to play chess? Or, like, after dinner, and we're already, like, eating dinner together at the dinner table, I'm like, hey, like, Let's just play a quick chess game. And um, yeah, I, he's he's too good, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's so cool. Um, I've been trying to get into chess a lot yeah. more as well. I think it can be such a fun game. Uh, but I think you do learn by playing with like people much better than yeah, you. Yeah, but, but it, it just becomes like a memorization game because these people have memorized every freaking opening there is. And I have not. And I suck at end games as well. So there's it's it's literally over for me. Like I literally, yeah. Um, like I know the basics and I know what I'm trying to do, like cross my rooks and whatever. Um, it's yeah, but it's not it, it I'm I'm just stuck. I'm hard stuck. It's kind of like I don't know, studying for a math test. Like those yeah. people know how to like do the problems, whereas me like pick up little pieces. Oh, like yeah. this, like this move. Oh, this is the situation I saw before when I was doing my puzzle. But yeah, exactly. it, it doesn't, it's not clicking in my head. No, no. But I still play it. So um I, I think it, it's just a challenge for me. Like I enjoy that kind of like um, yeah. there's so many different possibilities and you can never guess what's gonna happen or what the outcome will be. Do you have a chess club at Queens? Um, we do, but I never wanted to join because I didn't want to humiliate myself. But maybe I will this semester. Maybe I'll join one of their tournaments or something. Yeah, like I, I like Mac has a chess club, and they would just meet at the student center. And I think, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, there are a lot of people there. It's like a desk of like a bunch of desks that align to a horseshoe, and I think it like oh. is in order of elo. So it's pretty oh. like good so you can like and you move the way up like if you oh that great I, I would move like one seat and then I'd go, I'd go back yeah but it's, it's just a good learning environment and then you can watch like the really like really good players <laughs> play us so, ah! yeah okay maybe, maybe I'll maybe I'll consider it then if, if yeah. they have like an elo specific match yeah yeah That's yeah cool. what advice would you give to students looking I was I said looking to break into consulting but yeah. I don't know I think that's kind of narrow like what advice would you give to students period this one like I say to myself a lot like um like it will work out like it'll be okay and I know it's really cliche but I keep up I keep this kind of like um quote in my head like this too shall pass in the sense that um, whatever difficulty, challenge, adversity that you're currently facing, like like the other challenges that you've dealt with in the past, like it will you'll also be able to overcome it. And oftentimes than not, you'll overcome it becoming a, a better person as well, a more well-rounded, a more sophisticated, um, a more knowledgeable individual as well, who can be more empathetic to other um other people that you interact with, which I think is so important. It's it's really um like the adversities that we go through that um bring us together as human beings. I think um a lot of the time we we connect with others who have gone through similar challenges. And so um rather like lean into those difficulties and, and really, um, yeah, don't let those challenges like deter you or scare you from pursuing an opportunity though. I am a lot of times like guilty of that too. So um, I sometimes need that reminder and I guess this is a reminder for myself too, but um, yeah, I hope that resonates with some of you out there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that piece of advice, hopefully does it resonate with you, Annette? It definitely does. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into this episode of Friday with Friends. We got a little bit of everything here. We got a little bit about careers and upbringings and some psychology, some 
you know, Instagram, yeah. photography, chess, talk about everything. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. And let me know who you want to see next because we currently have no guests lined up. Uh, I am starting a full-time job soon. So oh. hopefully we'll keep this series going, but let me know, help your girl out and tell me who you want to see next. <laughs> okay, bye everyone. <laughs>